this trip, so this was earlier this month, but we went across the Netherlands, uh, across Belgium, and then ended in Paris, all yeah. without cars, um, yeah. which was really cool for me to let my kids experience. Um, but yeah, while we were there, we did, we visited Delft. Yeah. Um, we, so the partnerships that we've established with TU Delft are strictly on campus. Right now they've got, uh, a, okay. they've got a really nice setup uh, yeah. where they've got basically an intelligent campus. There's lots of sensors in the pavement that are detecting directional traffic. They're detecting the number of traffic. They're detecting right. environmental sensors and things like that. But they, this, this stress data is interesting to them because certain people will do certain things. I think right. you, the, I love this picture too. This is uh, my youngest and my wife in front were traveling south of Amsterdam mm -hmm. towards um, Outerkirk onto Amstel. Uh, right. It's a little bitty small community. But those two age groups and two genders that are depicted in the picture yeah. picked up on way different things. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Mike Sewell from Louisville, Kentucky. Mike and I have a conversation about some new innovative technology that he is working on that helps to evaluate just how comfortable an environment is for somebody who's occupying the space, whether it be a, a bike lane or a path or really any place, a park for that matter. Um, using biometric data uh, to be able to really evaluate how comfortable that environment is. It's a fascinating discussion. We also talk about some really cool uh, other things like you just got back from a vacation and uh, went to several amazing locations, some of my favorite locations in the world. Uh, so without further ado, let's get right to it with Mike Sewell. I am absolutely delighted to welcome into the podcast studio, Mike Sewell. Mike, how are you today? <laughs> I am fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Mike, uh, it's been a couple years since uh, we, we've seen each other, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, but why don't you do this? Why don't you just take a, a, a quick moment uh, to introduce yourself to the audience? Yeah, fantastic. Well, thank you, John. Uh, so everyone, my name is Mike Sewell. I am an engineer um, that loves multimodal. Um, I live in Louisville, Kentucky, and I work for a company called Gresham Smith. Up till about a year ago, I was primarily focused on complete streets type project. And a lot of that was related to urban planning. A lot of it was, uh, you know, putting back in what I thought was good infrastructure. And then I've transitioned over the past few months into a new role for the firm, which is more focused on innovation. Um, but I love any and all things about um, urban, urban design, transportation systems. It's kind of my bread and butter and what I went to, to school for, which I'm thrilled to be on the show talking with you all about. Fantastic. That's great. And, uh, and, and again, I did have a, a chance to, to meet you in Louisville um, for uh, the Congress for the New Urbanism. Uh, talk a little bit about that experience, because I, I believe you might have been part of the, the group that helped bring CNU there. Is that correct? Not part of the, the group that brought it here, but definitely one of the people that tried to backfill with programming and to make sure that the people that were visiting Louisville got to see all the cool things that were happening centered around just uh, the, the neat urban installations as well as our multimodal infrastructure. So yeah, uh, yeah. That, that in particular, I think that's when we met on the bike ride, which I did lead a tour of bike facilities um, I think in Indiana, at least too. So yeah, you got to well, see a lot in of fact, things. I've got that queued up. So uh, the oh, very nice. the very first time that we met, um, I uh, did what I tend to do, which is stick a microphone in your face. Here it is. <laughs> this morning, <laughs> woo, love it. I am so glad you guys are here to tour the Southern Indiana Greenway. It's a fantastic resource that we have in the Louisville area. I'm gonna be one of your guides. My name is Mike Sewell. I'm one of the owners of Gresham Smith, but I'm also a huge bike advocate locally. I'm a daily bike commuter. We help to put in lots of bike facilities basically all over Louisville with the help of Louisville Metro. Um, so we're really excited to showcase some of the neat things happening uh, with bike friendly Louisville. I'm Scott McGraw. <laughs> and then Scott Fantastic. goes on and on and on that. Uh, but yeah, so that was the very first time that we met. And again, I, I think I had like, you know, two minutes to introduce myself and say, oh, by the way, I'm filming this workshop. <laughs> and that was like the Saturday uh, bike tour. So it was actually technically right. after the majority of uh, the Congress had been done. Uh, but yeah, what a, what a great uh, activity asset. Uh, Scott goes on to talk a little bit about the the bridge that gets over the river and 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 some of that. Uh, talk a little bit about 
that scene, you know, what the, the, the being, you know, the bike uh, friendliness scene there in Louisville. Yeah, that's a really good, nice, nice story to tell. And honestly, it's been a lot of effort and there's been a lot of really great people that were doing good work up until, you know, 10, 12 years ago um, that we're just now seeing a lot of the fruits of their labor. So I think Louisville Metro has been a long time coming to to have a well-connected and multimodal friendly um, kind of city. But it's really been in the past few years that it's kind of solidified itself. It's um, you, you mentioned the bridge across uh, the Ohio River that better connects southern Indiana to to the riverfront in Louisville. That just opened up, you know, a handful of years ago, and it spurred on all of these other multimodal connections and, and I think a true passion for um, multimodal connectivity in our transportation system. So honestly, there's been a lot of things in the lead up, but we've seen a lot of this be realized, like the power of multimodal connectivity, uh, the desire of people to get out and see these types of, of great offerings we have in a city like Louisville in the past, I don't know, maybe the last six, seven years is when it really started firing on, or sorry, it started pedaling in high gear. How about that? Not firing there on all cylinders. There you go. Cylinders. I know I used that uh, analogy uh, on my last episode, firing on all cylinders, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hitting that pedal stroke revolution. Yes. Sure. <laughs> so one of the, the things that you had sent my way was a video clip of you testifying in Congress. And what I yeah. love about the the this particular video clip is it uh, you tell a little bit of your history uh, uh, yeah. about that and your story as to um, you know how you came to this. I think it'd be fun to play that. Is that okay? Yeah, I, I have no problem. It's it's a story yeah. I know and love. Here on behalf of the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Norman, as well as distinguished members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here to answer your questions about pedestrian and bicycle safety. My name is Mike Sewell. I am from Louisville, Kentucky, where I work as a professional engineer. I also serve as the active transportation service line leader and one of the owners of Gresham Smith. It's an architecture and engineering consulting firm. Uh, I'm representing not only the engineering profession today, but also the League of American Bicyclists, where I serve on their board of directors. But most importantly, today I come to you as a daily bicycle commuter. Uh, as little as a decade ago, I would be a very highly unlikely candidate to be talking to you about bicycle and pedestrian safety. However, as fate would, would have it, I uh, found myself stuck in a car in construction traffic, uh, watching pedestrians and bicyclists move across the Second Street Bridge, passing me. Uh, and so in a fit of frustration, I decided I would abandon my car on the side of the road and, and attempt to join them. Um, something serendipitous happened about halfway across that Second Street Bridge, though. I heard a bicycle bell, and as I looked over my shoulder, a bicyclist said, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? And in my, my current state of mind, I had a hard time matching his enthusiasm. And, and at that point, I had an epiphany. Uh, my choice of transportation that morning was negatively influencing my ability to enjoy myself. So I decided right then and there that the next day I was going to bike to work uh, the next day. That was almost eight years ago, and I'm pleased to say I've biked to work about every day since, and I now have a far better understanding of what it means to be joy, uh, joyful in a commute. I love it. <laughs> I'm sure it goes on and on and on, uh, but uh, I will make sure we have a, a link to, to that uh, YouTube video uh, for, for everybody else. That'll be in the uh, video description and in the show notes uh, for this episode. Uh, so please, you can pop on over there. And there's many other folks who had, were testifying uh, in Congress. Talk a little bit about that. Um, by the way, you, you clean up pretty nicely there that's thank yeah. you not not yeah. today but that, yeah, that yeah. took a lot of effort so <laughs> i apologize you got this version of me but that's okay um yeah, no, we'll, we'll the, talk a little bit about the version that we have now because the version we have now is very rested and has been like on vacation for the better part of the the you know that's absolutely right <laughs> I, I take a lot of neat trips i'll say that but yeah Going back to the business first, the, yeah. the testimony, I think the next bit of that is kind of this transformation that happened to me as an engineer, which I think is important to talk about. Um, I learned up, up before I started really taking bicycle commuting seriously, as well as the infrastructure uh, that we had at our disposal, um, I really hadn't questioned what I was doing or my role in any of these things as an engineer. Uh, typically, and I'm sure you've got lots of engineering friends, and, and I will pick on engineers in general uh, because it's fun, but we're, we're always the smartest people. We always have the right answers. It's a very 
um, you know, you, it's a matrix decision. If then else, this is the optimal system to put in based on uh, certain parameters of input. And when I took a look at what I was experiencing from a bicycle commuter or as a bicycle commuter, I realized that we were really falling down. We were not, um, I personally was not in probably most of the people that I was aware of in my, my circle of professionals was probably not uh, practicing to, to the, cert or the standard of care for all users on a road. And I think that's pretty um, common uh, for a lot of professional engineers that had came out of programs. Now, now, currently, it's starting to change a little bit. But back in the day, you went through like a transportation civil focused engineering program. There was not uh, pedestrian safety. There was not bicycle safety. It was only cars. It was um, the capacity driven analysis. It was turning movements to, to make sure large trucks can fit in certain roadways and maximizing efficiency making sure safety was there, but it's more safety for, for people operating vehicles than, than anything else. And when I really started embedding myself in the bicycle commute, um, kind of uh, other folks that were doing it too, I started picking up on lots of other things that I was oblivious to before. But I saw people biking, not, not crazy people like me and others out there that bike all year round, but people that that was their only choice. They were they were biking in ice conditions. They had ladders strapped to their, their bikes. These were folks that were not doing it because they had a choice. These were, they were doing it because that was their option. And it, 20, 2019, when I, when I was speaking to, to Congress there, that really, all the bedrock and the, the kind of the foundational issues that I were, had identified really came to kind of this aha moment for me. It's just like we could be doing way better to protect individuals on our corridors with the decisions we make as engineers, as well as us recognizing what engineers are good and bad at. A lot of what we what we have on paper and we stamp does not have the eyes of uh, transportation planners in many instances. It does not have landscape architects, urban planners, all of these things roll up into a better system that supports people's mobility. Um, yeah. So that was kind of like the, all of that led to that testimony um, in me trying to be a good advocate for safer funding and systems in, um, of transportation. Yeah. Yeah. And so this was 2019 when you were uh, presenting to com Congress on that. So um, when would you say it, the epiphany for you from from questioning the uh, your approach is that sort of that same is it in alignment with the epiphany of you jumping on the bike and starting to ride more frequently was it a was it yeah. was there an aha moment or was it this gradual sort of trickle of awareness yeah and that's a great question too i think anyone that has gone through a similar transformation i'm not unique in that other people discover that, that there are great modes of transportation that we've never partook in me flipping the switch happened way earlier. It was probably in 2012. And, okay. and you've probably talked to folks like this. Hey, I'm a bike commuter. You're a bike commuter. Everyone's, you know, everyone should be doing this. I'm really excited about this mode of transportation. It's easy to get excited about right. that when you discover it. And I think that was that rekindling of something that you forget about, you know, that was probably part of most of our childhood. And right. then you graduate from it into car ownership. And you're like, I'm yeah. done with this. And, right. and that, that reestablishing that as a, a part of my life later was, was really fun. And so that's when I got excited about it, but the aha moment happened, happened, I don't know, a couple of years after that, yeah. um, about the clicking with the engineering profession, about right. the clicking with, uh, making sure that we're taking other factors into consideration versus what's been laid out for us as best practices. Yeah. Since you brought it up, <laughs> um, it's one of the recurring themes here on the Active Towns podcast and end in the quest of trying to transform our built environment into a more people friendly environment. We come across this conflict of, of car dominance and car dependency and building our, our built environment to cater to cars and the and the influence or the impact that the engineering profession uh, has had on that. Talk a little bit about that, you know, from the perspective of the need, and you mentioned it briefly about the education, the need for sort of reforming how we're look, looking at this, the lens that we're looking at this so that we can do a better job of creating more people-friendly places. Yeah, that, and that's a really tough question, honestly. I think if you look at the, the set of, of guidelines that we have currently, all of them are focused on um, historic events. Right. These are this is where a problem has been experienced. This is our response to it from a professional standpoint, or this is the new standard of care that you should be 
kind of applying to your design projects, but they're retroactive. They're always looking in the rearview mirror. It's you're waiting for um, someone to lose their life, or you're waiting for a major catastrophe, transportation related catastrophe to happen before we decide to go and fix these things. And, and I think it's the wrong, uh, the wrong way for us to practice. I think we need to be, especially now, we've got a lot of new things at our disposal, a lot of innovations at our disposal, and some that I'm sure we'll talk about here in a little bit related to, to what I'm working on. But we've got lots of new things happening um, that we can use to our benefit as, as engineers and designers of spaces and transportation networks. And so we can't just rely on you know, guidelines established uh, 10 years ago and expect that to be good enough. I, I think that there's some really well-established cases of people applying what, in air quotes, best practices and guidelines to their projects and them not meeting the standard of care because the the context of a quarter, other things that engineers um, are probably not the best at talking through, um, the, the, the connection to people, how people react to certain things, the intuitiveness of transportation systems. Those are, those are emotional. Those are, those are, right. those are not things that you can just look up in a, in a matrix of numbers and say for, for this type of individual, this, these are the types of, of facilities that probably resonate the best with them and will make the most sense to them. Um, so it's, it's touchy and it's touchier and feelier than I think what most engineers would like to, to acknowledge personally. Right. Yeah, no, no, no. That that makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, I think Chuck Marone actually talks a little bit about that, about that in his most recent book, Confessions, and, mm-hmm. you know, I- acknowledging that there are things that engineers are incredibly good at and are incredibly Absolutely. necessary for us. But at the same time, there's things that they're a little bit ill-equipped with in, until they take a, a step back and have that paradigm shift, like what you were talking mm-hmm. about. Um, and I mentioned uh, Chuck, uh, he's going to be, uh, actually, we're going to be doing a live stream <laughs> right here on the on the nice. Active Towns channel uh, in two days on uh, on Friday, the, the, the 22nd. This is this is going out on Wednesday, the 20th. And uh, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be very, very interesting to, to, you know, continue this dialogue in, in this conversation because there's there's something that we miss when we um, design around the automobile. And mm-hmm. uh, I'm going to pull up this tweet that you that you put out from your vacation. And uh, since we did channel the fact that you just got back from sure. vacation and you're nice and rested and, and well recovered and everything. But I got a, I got a kick out of this because this you were visiting one of my favorite places in the world in Mackinac Island, uh, Michigan. And uh, you're like, hashtag bike holiday weekend starts at Mackinac Island. This place banned cars in 1898. And I already love it. Talk a little bit about that experience. I mean, it's not often in North America that you can find a place where you're not surrounded by motor vehicle noise. Yeah. Um, it, in that place, it's the first time I visited. Uh, my wife and her family have visited it multiple times, you know, growing up, and they always talk about this this place affectionately. And I kind of, I don't know why, especially with me being bike, but I've, I've never really said, like, we should go do that. But her family decided this year to go back. And the immediate kind of relief that I felt walking onto the main street and only being greeted by pedestrians, bikes, uh, lots of horses and horse manure. But uh, again, that's for a different time. But it's, it's not things that will kill me. It, it was enjoyable. And, and the same could be true. Um, and a lot of other, you know, smaller, smaller communities, I think, here in, in North America. You mentioned kind of the disparity that we have being so motor, motor centric. Um, a couple of people have, have covered this before, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but when you look at what devastation occurred when we started laying out our transportation systems, you had um, these interstates mapped directly through our urban cores, and the conversation about what happens when we dump all these high-speed moving vehicles into local roads is com- were completely missed by most engineers. Um, the, the answer was traffic lights, right? We're going to meter these things into these, these really busy roads, but then every other use... Um, got pushed to the sidelines, including pedestrians, including bikes. And it was really, really nice to see a place like um, like in Mackinac where it was only bikes and, horse, and horses and peds. And it was it was very relaxing. I think it's 
this, and we can talk a little bit too about the European bike, you know, adventures too. But it, when you get into a situation where you're in a downtown and you don't have this constant, you know, buzzing of motor vehicles, you just can, you can take things in and people scale, you are comfortable, you spend more money. Um, all of these things are, seem like great opportunities for especially historic communities that we've got in North America. Yeah. Um, and it's, there's great stories out there of other places that, that we can talk about too, that I've visited that there it, it works. And, and when you look at these places that have great examples of it working, I think that there should be so many other places applying these lessons learned in the decisions they're making at a local level. Um, that, that, that's a long winded answer probably than what you're wanting, but I, I'm gushing over it because it was awesome. Yeah, and you're right on the tail end of this. <laughs> it was, I think this uh, this photo was probably uh, just like a, a week or a little more than a week ago. And you're absolutely right. One of the things that I love about this, and this is sort of looking towards the downtown area and the harbor area, is that as you roll into um, the section where you're surrounded by buildings and everything, you could be rolling through on, on the bike and you can hear people talking and you hear the clop, clop, clop of the, of yep. the horses as they're coming through. And it's just, it, it's such an amazing sensation that you have uh, because you're surrounded by people and you, without the motor vehicle noise, you can actually hear voices and you can hear, you know, other, you know, amazing things. And it's some of the things that we experienced in the aftermath of the lockdown with the pandemic is with right. motor vehicle noises going down, you could actually hear uh, things that are around you. And it's just so pleasant. I wanted to, to, to pause on these uh, uh, two photos here that, that are the narrower path next mm -hmm. to the water and um it, it's part of the nine mile circumference you know of, of the island and so you're able to 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 experience the entire island and get to the more remote areas of the island talk a little bit about that rolling rolling down on this yeah. path with the family how cool was that it was it was awesome and you see my my other family members in front of my bike here uh ollie i should mention gets <laughs> yes. really angry if i get my little folding <laughs> bike out without dragging him along but he loved he loves being on the front of those bikes but yeah. the one thing i think that was really powerful about having a, a full network of low speed low stress bicycle friendly facilities is i had no problem letting my 15 or 11 year old yeah. take off on their bikes Right. They, they could go around the entire island and I didn't have any concerns whatsoever for their safety. Yeah. Um, that right there, I mean, and that's another point I think that gets missed is, uh, and I think we hear a lot of this probably from our parents' age group is yeah. go outside and play. Well, we've built, we've built terrible <laughs> places for these kids to try to go out and actually be active in. They're, they're disconnected from parks, they're disconnected from destinations. But but that place did a great job of of building in a transportation network and, and, and building in limitations on what could be used on that transportation network to make it safe. Yeah. And and it it was great. Yeah. It's yeah. Good stuff. There's Ollie. Again. And, there, yeah. and here's a, good, a better photo of Ollie. So your co-pilot. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's right. I love it, too. Um, I can't recall if we had the conversation about Bromptons when when I met you in, in Louisville because I was on my Brompton while I was filming. So probably, yeah, yeah, fantastic. Good. I don't remember, but yeah, they're great. That, that's a travel bike, I, as you know. I, I travel a lot and uh, yeah. for work and other, but um, that that bike has seen a lot of different countries, a lot of different destinations and miles. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and in fact, one of the, the the main reasons that I reached out to you to, to have this conversation was uh, the fact that you were in Denver, and so you were you, you were there, and you were you had your Brompton in tow, and you're uh, you know out there on the streets. And I'm like, you know, gosh, yeah, w what is Mike up to? I need to reach out to him and, and find out. Uh, so talk a little bit about what's what's happening in this photo. What's what's going on here? Yeah, well, and, and I'm sure I'll talk a little bit more about the origin of this, but I was actually in Denver um, doing two pilot projects uh, for, the, for the city of Denver and their innovation team there, um, which Rolf Isinger, I think you've, you've met and know him from, from way back. He's, he's one of those people that were making things happen in multimodal in Louisville before I kind of caught on. Um, he is now leading uh, their kind of a, a safety focus section of them in Vision Zero there. And another, another guy that I've met through introductions was really interested in 
uh, applying a new platform that I've been developing over the past several years about um, measuring human stress in the built environment. And so here you see several people have uh, modern wearables. Um, we're, we're taking a bike tour on, it's very specific and we've routed it through different context kind of classifications of roadway and multimodal facilities. And then we brought that back for a data analysis of what the stress data can tell us um, based on the types of, of facilities that we encountered. Cool. Let's yeah. um, let's cue up that uh, that video. Well, and if it helps too, I, I know we're we're getting ready to, to cue it up, but. Um, it, it, can I talk over this while it's going? Yes. So, Mike, you just mentioned that you were you were there on the ground in Denver, and uh, they had wearables on them. And so, this sounds like a technology thing. And so, walk us through kind of what this is, what this is called, and uh, and, and what it is we're we're seeing here. Yeah. So, this is like a very early version. This is um, a couple years old, but this is stress and ant trails of people walking through. This was in Tampa. Um, so we're actually recording location data. We're recording biometric data from modern wearables. Uh, I've built an algorithm that uh, basically mimics the calculation of EKG level data. EKG is electrocardiogram. It's high polling uh, heart rate data. Um, there are two main, and I'm going to get dorky and I apologize, John, but That's this okay. is, this is where I go. The, there are two primary methodologies for calculating what people typically call stress or our heart's ability to deal with a stressor, like a, a fight or flight mechanism. Um, I've built an algorithm that basically mimics that mimics that exact calculation or those, those calculations with very low polling heart rate data. So, um, if you, if you think through, let's say you step out into a roadway, um, from a normal heart rate uh, of, you know, 90. Um, if you cross the road, your, your heart is likely going to stay very linear. Even if you're running, it's a very linear increase across there. If you deal with, let's say a car buzzes you, you have a very um, sharp increase in not only heart rate, but your, uh, you have a galvanic response. Your, your you know, skin's um, starts exc excreting sweat in a very specific way. Blood flushes through to your legs to allow you to jump out of the way. Your eyes narrow. All these, these things happen within a fraction to a couple seconds um, over the course of that activity. And so I've built an algorithm that's really, really good at using what biometrics you, you, can, you can get from a modern wearable like a, like a, a watch. Um, and, and capturing where you exhibit those types of stress responses as fight or flight. So this is a very early version. This was when we were just doing heat maps basically over, over the course of a very small project. Um, now, since then, and, and I'm sure you, you'll share these videos after the fact, but, or overlay them, but we, we've really blown this up. So data scaling is, um, has gotten a lot easier. The opt-in process I can tie directly to modern wearable APIs. It's, it's automatically vetting data quality to make sure that it's, it's got really good reads on biometrics as well as uh, location data. Um, we've been going through kind of the IP protection and legal aspects as well as data, data you know, privacy because we wanna make sure we're doing what's right by users. And so all of these things have kind of been cogs in a, a massive wheel over the past several years. Um, but th this right here, our, the notion that we will we will exhibit stress in specific locations due to environmental um, types of things happening around us. When I say environmental, it could be lots of different things. It's not just necessarily that we've had a close encounter with a car or a bus, uh, but it could be urban heat island effect. It could be remnant. You know, if we've been hit a year ago, we we have this remnant effect of stress that occurs at that location. Um, it's been really interesting to see, too, over uh, kind of a bell curve of stress now, this notion that we don't want to be completely oblivious to our environment. We don't want to be completely stressed out all the time, but there's a happy medium part of that bell curve that's probably uh, the right level of exhibited stress to make us very aware of our surroundings, um, right. allows us to navigate safely, uh, is, is basically queuing up mathematical functions of our ability to interpret the environment around us. So that's where, that's where we're at now. Um, so yeah, this is an early version. Sorry for all the background dorky, um, you know, jumbo behind it, but there's been a lot of effort up to this point. Fantastic. So this is exciting because what we're really 
talking about here is um, being able to analyze scientifically um, what we are striving to do when we say we are striving to create an all ages and abilities uh, environment, a safe and inviting environment for everybody. And, um, you know, John and Mike might not be the best people to ask about, well, how was that facility? You know, oh, that was that was amazing. It was fantastic. It was great. But your wife or your children, they might be like, oh, my gosh, that was really scary. And mm -hmm. having the ability to get some biometrics of being able to see, oh, yeah, there there actually was a stress response there. It's not as safe and inviting as you think it is. Right. Uh, and, and there's and there's the data to prove it, especially if you can you know get enough numbers and be able to say, yeah, it's not just, you know, a handful of cool cucumbers that, you know, don't mm -hmm. have a stress response to uh, an environment that uh, when you take a step back, it's like, oh, OK, I get it. Or right, here, here's right. here's another favorite example I have is we build a protected or separated infrastructure from a, a walking and biking perspective, but it's it, it's not attractive or it's not comfortable. And it's like, well, what are you talking about? Safety, it's protected, it's separated, et cetera. It's like, yeah, but it's, it's you know, unattractive or, uh, or maybe it, it feels safe, again, to a bunch of dudes. But, you know, for, for ladies, it might be out, you know, rolling down the path. They might be like, no, this is, it's scary. There's all sorts of hidden right. areas and, and you, you didn't ask us. <laughs> so well, Yeah, well. Bring up several really interesting points. So the inception of this, and I don't know if you've got you've got some of these, but um, I was on a separate European bike trip with the Transylvania University where we biked across the Netherlands. And exactly what you're describing was kind of the impetus behind the creation of of this platform. It is um, I was experiencing. Yeah, these, these are some of the pictures of our first days biking. Biking. Uh, this is south of Amsterdam, heading to oh gosh, Leiden. Right. And yeah. this is this is the type of infrastructure they have. And, yeah. and you felt comfortable. You felt like every single piece of infrastructure was built for your enjoyment. It was well connected. It made sense. And if you got off of that infrastructure, you knew it right away. Yeah. Um, and that that trip really solidified I, that there's got to be a way to mathematically determine when those points happen. What, when, when are points of extreme stress occurring on a map? This is me, Smiley. This, this is after we visited, I think, 24 different cities biking. There's my, all my gear that pack. I took across. Yeah, I, I only pa pack. paused on this because I wanted to, 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 to reemphasize the fact that you guys had been riding and riding and riding, and this is your pack. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, this yeah. was the last day when we were getting ready to turn back in our bikes. But it was, it was um, eye-opening. There's one more yeah. picture I think that's in there. When we were leaving, it's a, it's got all of their, a lot of their bicycle infrastructure. And here's another example. Mm -hmm. It's just magical. And, right. and to your points of, yeah, we've we've checked the boxes. We've put we've put a bike lane in, but you don't have this type of experience, you know, uh, when you encounter anything here in the states. Yeah. But there is one. I think if, yeah, this is some of the the first day of biking when we're just like we our mouths were agape the entire trip. We're like, are you kidding me? This <laughs> is this me? is bicycle infrastructure. What yeah. what are we even doing living in North America? Yeah. But this was the place. So yeah. this is just outside of Leiden. Yeah. Um, we're leaving to go to Delft next. And at this moment, I was like, this is when the epiphany hit me of, I want to mathematically calculate this. There, there has got to be uh, something that exists that can tell us um, my comfort level at this location. Because right. if, you, if you go back and you think through when we first opened this, engineers love data, right? We like, yeah. we like to be able to point to things and say, yeah, this is quantifiable. Um, this makes sense to me. Uh, now that I've got data, I wanted that data set. And so yeah. that's what the new, it's, and it's called Empathic Analytics um, is, is the, the title of, of the platform I've been working on. But it does a really good job of identifying where those, those really stressful moments occur in our infrastructure or identifying where we're very comfortable. Yeah. Um, so the hope is now we can, we can aggregate lots and lots of data. Uh, we're still in development currently. It's, it's, going through uh, it's patent pending which is great i'm excited about that but we're going to get to a point hopefully later this year where we can open it up to the masses and allow them to share um their their 
ride data with us or walking pedestrians. It works for all modes of transportation. It doesn't have to be just, just cars, by the way. Right. But, um, you could, you could be in a car and experience different types of stresses, uh, related to your, you know, what you're enduring at a traffic light. And, and there's other thrills of exhilaration stress that, that can show up as a, as a driver. Um, you have, you know, dignity related stress that, that exhibits yeah. itself at, at bus stops. There's lots of, there's lots of things related to stress that I think the quantification of our experiences, our, our real user responses to the things we're putting in could be invaluable to, to us as engineers. Right. I lingered a little bit longer on this particular edge lane road, um, uh, facility simply because it's, uh, one of those topics that are you know starting to bubble up uh, quite a bit and um, it's we had an entire episode on this talking with uh, Michael Williams about edge lane roads and and the fact that they are starting to make their way out of the Netherlands and Denmark and, mm-hmm. and a few other locations where they're uh, where they have sort of developed and this is a really gr- good example of an edge lane road where uh, we see that it's a 30 kilometer per hour uh, mm-hmm. zone and we see uh, the uh, motor vehicle approaching. We see a person in, in the bike lane there. We also see that we have some parking off to the, to the right of, of the, mm-hmm. the lane as well. Um, and so there's a lot going on here. It's actually one of the less... Uh, comforting environments in the context of uh, of the the infrastructure that exists in the Netherlands, mm-hmm. um, and it only really works when motor vehicle volumes are are low enough to the point where it you do have a a higher comfort level. Uh, I myself yeah. uh, rode on an edge lane road uh, in between Schiphol Airport and mm-hmm. Leiden <laughs> and yep. uh, on my Brompton. And uh, and it was not a comfortable environment. The motor vehicle drivers yep. were driving much too fast. It might have actually been, a because it was not an urban context, it might have actually been uh, signed at 50 kilometers per hour. And so it was mm-hmm. a wholly inappropriate application of an edge lane road. But the interesting thing uh, to this context is that ability to get some biometrics to, to look at it and say, yeah, I mean, the design seems mm-hmm. right and the, and the signage seems about right, but something about it's not right. We're noticing higher stress levels. You know, what can we do to you know, improve upon this? Um, or, you know, or maybe it, there needs to be more of a, a modal filter to get, you know, to bring the traffic volumes down um, or yeah, something. I don't absolutely. Know. Yeah. Or other. No, no, you're, coming. Yeah. You're, you're exactly right. You can't just pick one fix and slap it on, uh, you know, a certain context and expect it to work in a different context. The, your example of the rural um, kind of edge edge lane think the right. edge lane yeah. examples we went through those too um yeah. and, and it's it's that rural version of what you just saw in an urban setting with lower speeds there was more traffic in the urban setting a lot more traffic like cars yeah. were there in the urban setting but in the rural roads you may only see two cars the entire trip but they're traveling 50 55 kilometers per hour yeah so you're exactly right but but again our ability to say what that does to us as a user, I think, is very important. Um, and, and something of note, when you've got these, you know, like the, the top 5% of stressful locations, we're far more likely to make a mistake as a user. And it, it, it's that combination of our ability to respond to a fight or flight uh, event that happens to us while we're navigating on a roadway. And that could be for any user. Yeah. Um, we're far more likely to make a mistake and kill someone or, or injure ourselves or injure others. Um, and so it's, it is important to yeah. it's just the recognition that, that we do operate in those types of environments, but now we can quantify what that, what that experience, uh, looks like. Yeah. Now he had mentioned, um, the opportunity to maybe open this up so that, uh, it, it can be widely available. Uh, talk a little bit more about that because if, I mean, this, this could be massively important and helpful for many, um, many communities, uh, but I, I can imagine that uh, it, it might be cost prohibitive if it if it was just, you know, something that was no. Yep. Yeah, it, it's we've got it. Come hire yep. us. 
Talk, talk a little bit more about that. I know you guys are in, in the business of, of making money, but at the same time, it, sure. it sounds like you've alluded to the fact that you understand how incredibly impactful and important this is for society. Yeah, it, well, and it's a really good point. I think the, the thing that I will credit Gresham Smith, which is my, the engineering firm that I, I work for, uh, they've been very uh, accommodating. They've, they've let this kind of develop um, naturally. Uh, we've been very deliberate about um, us not charging for it with our, our current partners and making sure that it's working well, that it's been validated through really strategic partnerships, that we're thinking through how to make uh, the most of automation. So we're not um, necessarily, we don't have to be under contract then to have someone take this and, and benefit from it. And I'll mention some of the strategic partnerships just because they've been so um, important to the development of, of the current version, which we haven't, you haven't yet seen uh, on, on the podcast or the, the video podcast. Uh, but Vanderbilt University, they, they've been very accommodating, not only with their uh, medical staff, just to vet, because I'm an engineer, right? I'm, a, I'm not only just an engineer, I'm a civil transportation engineer, uh, with my background at college was in structural. I, I don't have a lot of experience um, with with biomedical types of calculations, but I'm re I'm really strong at math. So I've developed an algorithm and it's been tw I've been tweaking it over the past several years. But I needed that vetted. Vanderbilt um, has has helped to validate what we're doing, which is important. And it's a different method uh, than than what they've they've been accustomed to. So we're now working. Uh, to get it published because we do want others to, to understand that there's value in, in using this data. So um, that's one thing, the scalability. We, we engage the, the other side, the student staff at Vanderbilt, and they put together a student team that's allowed us to scale this, uh, test the opt-in, um, test APIs to different fitness activity trackers and things like that that are capable of recording um, polling data that, that leads to a, a, a meaningful stress analysis. That partnership allowed us to do that bit of scalability. We've now got partnerships with Denver uh, is one of those cities where we're doing some pilots. So they're opening up um, a, a lot of new ways to uh, analyze the data that will help us. Uh, they, they're pulling in University of, of Colorado, Denver, uh, or University of Denver, Colorado. Uh, we've got partnerships now with TU Delft in the Netherlands. We, That's right, they're, yeah. they're, doing, they're doing the same thing. We've got a pilot project there where they're analyzing what this means for all the other types of sensors and corroborating this data with other things that they've been collecting. Partnerships with Amsterdam. Uh, so there, there's all of these separate th partnerships with the University of Louisville. They're, they're doing a fantastic job. We've probably collected more data with the, the student team at the University of Louisville than, than we have any other place. And all of these things are, are we're tackling them um, at no cost because we want to make sure that when we put this thing out there for other people to digest that it works and it works exactly like we believe it should. We've got modules built into it that allow this automatic kind of translation or corroboration with other data sources. Um, and it's, it's gotta be robust and it's gotta be simple to use. So we're really being thoughtful about the progress on, on the platform. But I will say, uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful later this year that you'll be able to fire up um, an Apple or Android device and get a personal stress map for yourself. So that's where we're going. Um, and when we can get that level of, of data and when you can personally see what's, what areas are causing you stress, you could potentially open it up to, I, I want to map myself to work in the least stress possible. You know, it, you could, you could start right. to really blow the doors off it. And we're only talking about transportation. We've got right. other partners in healthcare in right. you know, other market segments that are very interested in applying this to, um, you know, the nurse stress situation right now or sure. respite and recovery. Lots of other things are, are, are coming to light as a result of the, the work that we've done up to this part, uh, up to this point with, with these partnerships. So I, I can't stress enough that I love yeah. the partners that, that have been active in it up to this point, but the whole intent is to get a, a platform that is approachable, right. um, that is very scalable, that we can collect lots and lots of data and visualize that in a meaningful way. Yeah. Uh, and that's what that direction we're, we're heading t towards. Yeah. It, it makes me think a little bit about the opportunity to evaluate um, 
uh, at other types of activity assets. Uh, I, I view the world through a lens of, of activity assets and, and places that help encourage healthy, active living. So mm -hmm. uh, obviously we're talking about pathways and, and protected bike lanes and things of that nature. Um, but mm -hmm. also, you know, parks, you know, how, mm -hmm. how truly safe and inviting is this yes. park? You know, is, is it an environment that, that really, uh, you know, gives that, 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 that respite from, the crazy world around us. And so, uh, wonderful opportunities here. And again, um, I think it is important. You mentioned it earlier, you know, there's that ick factor of big data and, you know, this is being collected. So making sure that this is, uh, anonymous in, in such a way, uh, that it, it, it's, you know, personal information isn't, to, isn't tied to it is, is important, but more importantly, as you said, scalable, because that's a critical factor. I mean, yes, we could Absolutely. put, uh, we could do um, uh, interviews and focus interviews and, and say, you know, hey, how how comfortable is it riding in this environment and, and get that feedback, but it's an incredibly costly thing and, and, and very much time intensive. And so being able to leverage technology in a, a positive way and, and hopefully a not an, an mm -hmm. icky <laughs> invasive way yeah. uh, to be able to, 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 you know, get that feedback. Um, and I, and I had to put this photo out there because it, it's, it's also from your vacation, but a different vacation. <laughs> different vacation. So We've you, took all the vacations this year, John, by the you way. You just took them all. <laughs> you know, you, you, we did. you had them all piled up because you had mentioned TU Delft. Um, I think you went mm -hmm. over to TU Delft um, for some business work. Did you just stay there? <laughs> Yeah, we, I should have. Uh, yeah. And I didn't realize how, how, you know, oppressive the heat was here until I got back from Mackinac, actually. And, and then I realized that we should we should totally live and work remote. Yeah. But this this trip. So this was earlier this month, but we went yeah. across the Netherlands, uh, across Belgium and then ended in Paris, all yeah. without cars, um, yeah. which was really cool for me to let my kids experience. Um, but, yeah, while we were there, we did. We visited Delft. Yeah. Um, we, so the partnerships that we've established with TU Delft are strictly on campus right now. They've got uh, a, okay. they've got a really nice setup uh, yeah. where they've got basically an intelligent campus. There's lots of sensors in the pavement that are detecting directional traffic. They're detecting the number of traffic. They're detecting right. environmental sensors and things like that. But they this the stress data is interesting to them because certain people will do certain things. I think right. you, the I love this picture, too. This is a. Uh, my youngest and my wife in front were traveling south of Amsterdam mm -hmm. towards um, Outerkirk onto Amstel. Uh, right. It's a little bitty small community. But those two age groups and two genders that are depicted in the picture yeah. picked up on way different things. And so yeah. the really interesting thing about TU Delft as well as the city of Amsterdam, Gemente Amsterdam, is they're interested in what do specific genders interpret as stressful, what do specific age groups exactly, interpret right interpret as stressful. And what their hope is, is that they can start to identify, um, and I won't say uh, flow state just yet, because I don't think I can, man I can calculate it just yet. But the right. hope is we calculate optimal levels of stress right. that, will, that will corroborate the lack of crashes or people's um, surveys saying that they were most comfortable on the specific route or on the specific day or piece of infrastructure. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just all of these things are starting to really fall into place, but it was all based in um, our ability to, to be empathic. That's that's what the name of it, the, the namesake exists for that reason. I want to know what's happening to these other users so I can better design for them. Yeah. And that that is exactly it. And the reason behind this, it's it's making sure that we can we understand what other people are going through because of the decisions we make. Yeah. And uh, the technical term for for positive stress is eustress. And so it's that, yeah. you know, that concept of uh, if it's if it's if there's absolutely no stress, um, it's analogous to, you know, mm -hmm. that that wide lane on the freeway and you're sort of lulled into a false sense of security and you That's sort of exactly start dozing it, yeah. off. You know, there's there's absolutely mm -hmm. no stimulation there. Right. And so, um, yeah, it's. 
it's one of the things that uh, can also happen, <laughs> you know, in yeah, on, sure. a, a great example of that uh, from a bicycling perspective is you're, you're lulled into a false sense of security and you turn the corner and, and there's, there's a hazard or something there and, and, and you just didn't, you, you weren't sort of like on it. And so there, you, yeah. you need to find that, that, that happy medium. Okay. So we have to do this because again, you you were off on vacation, European vacation, so uh, you, you, you did go Paris. into it. You, you yeah. made your way to Paris, and uh, so for for those who aren't uh, uh, aware of what this is, what are we looking at? So the Arc de Triomphe uh, is a nightmare, um, and, and you see there. In most of Paris was like this. There's not a lot of lane um, striping anywhere. Right. And this is no exception. This is probably yeah. if I if I paste it off, it would maybe be ten lanes between where I'm standing and right. and the arc. Uh, no no lane lines, no differentiation between who should be yielding and not. And we actually saw an accident, a crash happen while we were standing here because I was just like, it's beautiful, right? But what a nightmare, uh, you know. Yeah. And the, the the true failure in intuitiveness here, but. Yeah. They, they've gotten so bad and there's so many crashes now at this location that it's a it's a no fault insurance site right In, insurance will you you have to cover your own crash if if, if you encounter one here because yeah. there's so many crashes at this location beautiful monument absolutely yes. atrocious yeah. to, to navigate in a, in a car you yeah. if you're a pedestrian you can walk to it in a tunnel which is just beautiful but yeah so you ready to be jealous? I, let's see it. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah. So in 2015, when I was there in Paris, I filmed uh, Paris uh, on the car free day. And so I okay. have footage oh, yeah. of the, the La, La Arc de Triomphe uh, with no cars on the Champs Elysees. And and that's that's hopefully going to be the future for for yeah. Paris and for the Champs Elysees and for the the Arc de Triomphe is get to that point as to where it will it may not be car free but it'll definitely be car light and yeah. uh, so so you're hanging out in 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 Paris there and you're seeing um, some transformations now have had you been to Paris mm -hmm. before no, this was the first time I had okay. been there, and and uh, so we we really went. We were everywhere uh, yeah. in the city. I think we probably packed way too much in into the visit. Yeah. But it's interesting you said the car free. So when you talk to the locals, yeah, especially the people um, that that arrive in cars, right. they were not happy with with the local oh, yeah. mayor. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of tension that exists between what the mayor believes is the right course of action for the transportation right. network there and, and what a lot of people that are very car dependent, which me as an outsider, uh, the, you can't beat Netherlands infrastructure as far as I'm concerned. The, right. the connectivity, the rail service, everything is fantastic. But I had no issues at all um, with the, the metros in Paris, the RER you know, trains. Everything worked very well and it was a very well connected city. So they, they're probably a little more of kind of the Americanized version of car centric um, with, with still better transit <laughs> service than what we've got. But there's a lot of pushback happening in, in yeah. Paris. Especially well, and, right and more now. power to, to, to the mayor. Um, uh, and Hidalgo is, is sticking to her guns. Mm -hmm. She knows right. that this is the, the right thing to do. Um, the, the quote that she had uh, in the press uh, leading up to that very first car free day when I was there, I think it was September 27th of 2015 um, when I filmed mm -hmm. that. Uh, she says, hey, we've got a problem. We can't even see the Eiffel yeah. Tower through the, the smog. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, she has made tremendous steps and her, her team, um, of, of making some transformations. So, uh, I'm super jealous right now because Clarence Eckerson is in Paris as we are recording nice. this. And so I'm like, ah, get some good stuff, Clarence. Uh, I know oh, he, he always does. I'm, oh, I'm he sure he'll does. get the worst nightmares of traffic that oh. exist in Paris. He's made I a know, country. I know. But what's really, really exciting is to see how much has started to change. And so I can't wait to get back there. I may be able to squeeze that in. In, um, in my October, November trip to the Netherlands, I may jump on over to, uh, to Paris to check that out. But it's interesting because the, you also visited um, Bruges. Mm -hmm. And so this is uh, just a couple of photos from here because what really s jumps out at me here is just how important it is to have places for people 
Talk a little bit about that. And what does that make you feel like when you're in a place like this and in a place like Delft, uh, where you can just be surrounded by, you know, by people. And again, maybe hearkening back to what you felt like when you were in Mackinac. Yeah, I, that's a really good question. And I think this, this realization of the sense of place that, that is pictured here and, and, a lot of the other examples share that. It, the sense of place, um, I don't think engineers should be responsible for designing it. These, these are things that happen when you're very deliberate with the focus on people. You've got landscape architects at the table. You've got urban planners that understand the importance of, of parks and public space. Um, it, that's not an engineering thing that we can engineer into our plans. We just have to be able to, to let our walls down and understand that these other professionals need to have a seat at the table. Um, I think that's that's the most concise answer I can give you is this recognition that these these things can't be engineered to the point where they're going to be as enjoyable as this. Yeah. But those those other professions, landscape architects, uh, urban planners, um, transportation planning to a certain extent, those yeah. those folks do have those skill sets. And, and you can create really magical, really comfortable, really inviting places that are still well engineered by right. by coupling all of the fantastic things that all of those professions have to offer. I think the the difficulty now that we have here, you know, we've got a handful maybe of places that I would say I've felt as comfortable as I did in any of those those cities and towns we we visited in Europe. Yeah. Um it's it's very much by design. We we've got terrible um, land use. It's spaced out. We don't have densities. Uh, we're still making terrible decisions about what land uses should be and could be and, and might be best benefit you know us as consumers of space. Um, we're not protecting our most valuable uh, public space that we've got. We're we're making bad meaning the right away. We're making bad decisions with what we've got. Um, and, and so I think it, it really is going to take a, another look in the mirror. Of what, what are we really designing for? Are we designing for, uh, you know, efficient movement of, of cars at all, at all other, you know, costs? It, we shouldn't be. I mean, the, we should be designing for people. We should be designing at the end of the day. This is, this is the engineer's creed. And I've said this on other interviews and, and things, but we didn't, we didn't stand up and take an oath, uh, you know, professional engineer's creed to protect cars at all costs. It's protect right. the, the, the goodwill of, of humans. Um, and I think that that's really something that we probably need to remember. Um, and, and again, engineers are awesome. We're, we're really, really good at, at solving issues, solving certain types of problems. Right. But it's this acknowledgement that other people are just as passionate and just as good at solving problems too. And then it's this, this moment of coming together when if you're in it for the common good, if you're in it to really design great places for people and not just connections through other places, then then you can you can do this. We can do this here. It just takes a lot of tough decisions. Yeah. You mentioned the word density. And so, uh, you know, I look at this photo and I think of light density. You know, we're, we're talking mm -hmm. about something that's very, very comfortable. Um, it doesn't have to be something that is is fear inducing and uh, right. that gets to the land use challenges so that we can start to, to correct and transform some of these environments. This photo also um, reinforces uh, one of my mantras is, is that streets are for people um, mm -hmm. and and pooches <laughs> and, and horses, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know, they're for everybody. Like, yeah. They're for everybody. And, and, and streets, the historical context of streets, of course, is that they've been around for thousands of years. Uh, the motor vehicle was an invention that we brought forth and, in, and in, instilled into the street environment just within the last hundred and some odd years. So, right. um, we have a, uh, I, I think, a, a reckoning to, to understand that much of what we have built um, to the detriment of our public spaces and our quality of life, the health and well-being of our residents, as well as the environment, uh, we need to have that realization and we need to have Absolutely. that uh, sort of humble sort of acknowledgement, <laughs> whether you're the politicians or city staff or the engineers, to be able to say, um, you know, hey, we got it wrong. We do need to to correct some of these mistakes. And you mentioned that something that was very, very um, important. And, and, and Chuck Marone says this as well, is that 
engineers are incredibly smart individuals and they're very caring Mm -hmm. and they can solve problems. They're really good at solving problems. We just need to get the correct problem served up to them (laughs) in the correct context. You're exactly right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, and one one other thing too about the problems we're trying to solve now is if you look at um, the Governor's Highway Safety Association does a really good job of capturing uh, current issues that exist in the right of way. Like what are really the root causes of crashes happening? Um, and if you look at the top, I mean, you can pull it up. The, the, the list of, of the top seven, um, five of those are behavioral in nature. Five of those are not because we've got really high speed roadways uh, or, or have made awful decisions in our public space. They're, they're, people are more distracted. There's way more going on in their personal lives that they have to deal with and, and they're, they've got shorter tempers. Um, people are imbibing and, and trying to operate motor vehicles. And it's all, it's all the systemic problem of we've built terrible places that are not good at alleviating stress. We're, we're dealing with this more and more, as, especially post-pandemic. We've got more people back on our roadways, and now they're contending with inflation. They're contending with all of these other issues that are, that are just compounding on, on everyone's daily lives. And unfortunately, we the beginning of the day and the end of the day are two of the most stressful stressful times you know that we've got when we're commuting and people are operating, you know, things that kill people, and in vehicles. And it's just like this realization: um, can we drop the speed limit? Sure. As the context of, of a corridor going to support them now adhering to that speed, that new speed, probably not. Can we can we start to tackle the issue of of creating more livable, more comfortable, more um, attractive roadways? Yeah, we can do that. We can passively remove other things that that could put put other people in danger by passively influencing speeds, by making sure people have access to green space and parks, by making sure people have things that make their lives easier. We can make those decisions as engineers, and it's just everyone coming to the table and then designing better space um yeah. but you you're you're nailing it yeah i'm going to leave us with the uh, the going back to the edge lane road because a couple of the things that you said uh there uh you know we, we can talk about in the context of of this type of of infrastructure in the sense that it it demands attention part of the reason why um this infrastructure works is it re-emphasizes the need to, to bring your motor vehicle speeds down. It, uh, you know, essentially it's, it's a, it's designed so that the motor vehicle drivers are sharing the, the gray colored tarmac there in the middle mm-hmm. and there's a motor vehicle coming at you. And so mm-hmm. it becomes like a, a North American version of, uh, of a yield street, you know, which is very, very common in some of our older uh, residential areas where, you know, if you, especially if you have cars parked on either side, there may be only enough space for one motor vehicle. And so uh, re-emphasizing patience, just, you know, don't yeah. be in such a hurry, relax, you, you, you know, it's, you don't get upset and don't get impatient. Uh, you're going to get there. We'll all get there. Uh, but you do need to do that. And so, I would even say that uh, a fair amount of what we can do as city designers is to create an infrastructure that then helps dictate and helps prompt the proper behavior. Uh, There's nothing there's nothing worse than being uh, a motor vehicle driver being in a hurry and wanting to be done and wanting to get home and being on a, you know, uh, a wide lane or on a freeway or trying to get over a bridge mm-hmm. and be stuck in traffic and being stuck in gridlock. Yeah. It, you know, the talk about stress levels going up. It's like that's no going up. And so that's one of the things. And, and again, to, to, to your point earlier is that the Dutch have done this very, very well. They've mm-hmm. teased out a lot of these mobility networks in such a way that the numbers of conflicts between the different um, the different modes is has been eliminated or minimized and so if you're on the transit line you're not having to have a lot of friction with the motor vehicle you know lanes and system and if you're in the motor vehicle lane system you're not having a lot of conflicts with people who are walking and biking uh they're they've actually designed that in so that there is uh a little bit more peace on the road (laughs) yeah well and one one quick response to we we do have good resources here. 
Yeah. Um, ITE designing walkable urban thoroughfares yeah. has a lot of really good examples of exactly the picture that you just displayed leaving Delft in the Netherlands. Yeah. It, it adheres to a lot of what's in that manual. Yeah. The, the difference is, is it's way easier to maintain the status quo in the states. Right. It's way easier for us to, in air quotes, say we're practicing the, the standard of care by just checking boxes in a singular Ashto green book um, at our disposal because it's right. easy. Yeah. Um, making, making good decisions on our corridors is difficult. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. We, yeah. we can't just flip a switch and, and make better decisions that are going to positively influence users. But we do have good resources. There are great examples of other uh, use cases, best practices, implemented projects that we can point to and say, these are something I could probably try on my project. When I say try, that doesn't mean you're not following the standard of care. There there are lots of really good examples of things included in in manuals that we have at our disposal. All of these things are guidelines, though. You still have to be flexible. We we are smart. You, you know, all, we we went through exactly. college for multiple years of not to to do if then else statements in our professional lives. Yeah. Let's let's be flexible and, and let's we can get to a lot of these behavioral issues, a lot of these designing for users. This is kind of new topics for for a lot of us. Right. But let's have the conversations. Let's have other people coming to the table that are that are specialists in that, and let's let's. Be flexible in, in our approaches to, to resolving some of the issues that they're currently experiencing yeah. as yeah. a response. Yeah. And and that's, you know, reflects a little bit of my uh, story to this this space, too, is, you know, my background is in behavior modification and, and mm-hmm. you know, health behavior and, and encouraging people to live healthy, active lifestyles. And so I've, you know, that's where my headspace has been for the last 33 years or so, has been really working on how do we create an environment that encourages people to live the healthiest, uh, most productive lives. And so uh, good stuff. Any last thoughts, anything that we didn't cover that you want to make sure that uh, we leave the audience with? I would just say I, I don't have anything, you know, huge to, to relay outside of what we've discussed today, outside of the challenge. The challenge is we're dealing with new issues. Uh, the challenge is we've got limited budgets on projects. Uh, there's lots of challenges that are stacked up against us in, right. in favor of of doing a lot of the the really sexy multimodal and complete streets things that we've talked about today, but but you should be doing it. You should be you should be taking on that challenge because that's the job. So I would say to engineers that are listening in or urban planners or, or anyone, um, there are there and there's lots of us out there. There are lots of really good engineering engineering firms and engineers that get it. Yeah. And I would say don't settle. You keep finding the other ones that believe in the power of doing our jobs for real people and, and we'll build better infrastructure. I know we can do it. I, I, there's too many great examples of people loving their commutes in other, other locations for us to just neglect that as examples. Right. Yeah. No, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Oh, I, I know what I wanted to also just say is you mentioned good resources. Obviously, the NACTO uh, organization, mm-hmm. the NACTO guides coming out, um, and also um, the attempt to try to make an influence on the MUTCD uh, mm-hmm. you know, design guide that is out there. Um, so, you know, the hard work is being done and, and trying to make yes. it easier for... Uh, you know, the engineers who are doing hard work out there in their communities to be able to to know that, you know, there there are resources out there for them. So I just want to, to emphasize that as well. Mike, yeah, it has I been, could not agree more. Yeah, no, that that is so it's so exciting to see the work that you are doing here uh, in yes. this arena, capturing these, uh, you know, the biometrics and getting a sense as to truly being able to evaluate how comfortable an environment is. It, it's really, really uh, good work and important work. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing this uh, with the audience. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It, it's an absolute pleasure. A big fan of the podcast. Um, and, and I cannot wait to give you updates after we go live with the Empathic platform. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Mike Sewell. And if you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just hit the subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell right next to it to customize your notification preferences. And quick reminder, uh, coming up on Friday, July 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern is my live streaming event with Chuck Marone with Strong Towns. I uh, hope you're able to uh, join us 
us and uh, maybe pose a question or two for us. <laughs> and two final reminders, uh, don't forget uh, the Active Town Store for some fun streets are for people, swag out there, water bottles, t-shirts, all that good stuff, as well as uh, Patreon. If you have the ability to help support my efforts to produce this content, uh, hey, a buck a month, two bucks a month, five bucks a month, whatever, uh, every little bit helps uh, and is greatly appreciated. Um, please pop on over to patreon.com slash active towns. Thank you all so much for tuning in. It's wonderful having you along for the ride. Until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.